Okay, well, good evening to everybody here in person and those online. Uh, it's great to have you here. I'm Mark Marley. I'm the director of the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory. And welcome to the resumption of uh, the LPL public lecture series. Uh, the last uh, in-person public event we had was in the fall of uh, 2019. So it's great to see you all here and uh, everyone that's uh, joined us online. The lecture series this fall is going to focus on the formation of planetary systems and understanding uh, the ha habitability of planets in our solar system and beyond. And so you're welcome to join us uh, in, on, on October 19th, when uh, Professor Ty Robinson is going to be talking about finding other Earths with next generation telescopes. And on November 16th, when our brand new professor, Super Ranjan, uh, it will also be talking on this theme, although we don't have quite his title from them just yet. For our lecture today, uh, please hold your questions till the uh, to the end of uh, Dr. Pascucci's lecture, and then we'll take uh, questions live uh, in the room and also online. Uh, those of you online, please uh, go ahead and type any questions you have uh, by using the Q and A button. In the Zoom, uh, in the Zoom controls, and then we'll read those out loud um, at the end. Also, if those of you that are students and are here, uh, maybe get some class extra credit. Um, after you uh, depart the lecture today, our staff outside have a stamp that they'll stamp uh, your notes with um, to uh, indicate that you were uh, really here live and in person. So with all those formalities, let me um, I'm pleased to introduce our, uh, our speaker tonight. It's Professor Ilaria Pascucci. Um, Ilaria was uh, born and raised in central Italy, uh, received her undergraduate degree from the University of Bologna, and her PhD from the Max Planck Institute of Astronomy uh, in Heidelberg. She came to LPL in 2011 when she joined the faculty. And she uh, was promoted to full professor just this year. And she also serves as our associate department head, helping me uh, organize and, uh, and run the institution that is LPL. She is the, uh, has been honored by many prizes and awards. Uh, notably, uh, she was recognized as a fellow of the American Astronomical Association, of uh, the American Astronomical so Society uh, just earlier this year. She's published over 150 scientific papers uh, many of which are very highly cited. So she's a very accomplished scientist and <clears throat> really knows her material for understanding in, his, in her research and understanding the formation uh, and evolution of planetary systems. Uh, so with that said, I will turn it over to Dr. Pascucci, who is telling us about revealing planetary systems in the making with ALMA and NASA's Webb Telescope. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. Can you hear me well? In person, great, on Zoom, I think so. Okay, so um, I'm really happy to be here and have the opportunity to tell you a bit about uh, what we are learning on how planets form, thanks to these two incredible facilities, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, in short, ALMA, and uh, the James Webb Space uh, Telescope. I want to start the presentation by showing you um, one of the great pictures of the night sky uh, here in Tucson. And uh, you can see here uh, part of the Milky Way. And uh, the point is that whenever you look up uh, at this beautiful sky, I want you to remember that uh, we know already of more than 5,000 extrasolar planets, meaning planets orbiting around other stars in the Milky Way, our own galaxy. And not only that, we know of more than 1,800 planetary systems, meaning more than one uh, planet orbiting the same star like in the solar system. So with the animation I'm going to show you now, what you will see uh, is here in the center, the orbits of the rocky planets in the solar system. So Earth is there. The sizes uh, uh, of the circles are the relative sizes of the planets. So you can see that some of the planets that have been discovered are much larger than Earth, others are comparable in size, 
the colors are meant to represent the, the um, expected temperature of these planets. And so you see there are planets as cool as Earth, but there are also planets that are much hotter. And then finally, the motion indicates uh, essentially the relative distances of these planets from their own stars. And so I love this animation because uh, it really shows that nature can be really a diverse uh, planetary system. And there are out there many different types of planets and planetary systems. So one of the questions that comes when uh, you look at such uh, diversity is, uh, how do these planets form? Uh, another question that I'm really passionate about, but unfortunately I don't have time to uh, discuss in this talk, is how common are Earth-like planets? Because uh, as we hear in the next uh, um, talk of this series, we are going to build instruments that actually will be able to detect some biosignature. So this is a very important question. But again, uh, because of uh, the time available, I decided to focus only on the first question today. And so we'll be talking on how do these planets form? And again, we'll be uh, discussing these two large facilities, ALMA and James Webb. I want to show you uh, some videos uh, for, of these uh, facilities to highlight some of the uh, key properties. So we start with the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. Uh, so here you can see uh, the location of ALMA, which is 5,000 meters above uh, sea level. And this is because to observe at the um, wavelengths of ALMA, you need a very dry uh, atmosphere. This is one of the driest places uh, on Earth. Down here, you can start to see uh, some of the telescopes. Now, uh, the video will zoom in into the, the, the telescopes. There are 66 uh, antennas. You can see some of them here. Most of them 12 meters in size. So these are really large uh, antennas that um, uh, work together to improve uh, the sensitivity, so being able to see deeper uh, in the sky, as well as uh, the uh, spatial resolution, so see uh, clearer images and pictures. Uh, again, uh, they work together, and here um, it is shown that they can be moved to different distances to achieve different sensitivity and, and different uh, spatial resolution. So as an example, you could place an antenna here at the LPL and another one at Stewart, so across the street. This would be the closest configuration that you can have. But you can also place an antenna here at the LPL and the other one up to the Catalina Mountain. So just to show you how large is this place. This is uh, an international collaboration. Chile, uh, the um, uh, US, uh, Europe, and the National Observatory of Japan. Now, uh, the other one, James Webb, I'm sure you have all heard about it. Um, uh, here, uh, it's a video showing the launch of this uh, space observatory. It was launched last year, December 25th. Uh, everything went uh, uh, as planned, so you will see pretty soon uh, images of scientists really happy of this launch. The launch uh, happened with the Ariane 5 rocket from the um, European Space Agency. This is also an international collaboration. NASA, the European Space Agency, and the Canadian Space Agency. This telescope, oh yes, I should mention that uh, what you're going to see here is actually the last picture of James Webb just after it detached from the Ariane 5 and started its journey to its location uh, where it is now to take uh, scientific images. You will also see pretty soon that uh, um, the telescope starts to become larger. In fact, uh, um, the first thing that happened was the deployment of the sun shields. The sun shields are uh, meant to protect the telescope from the heat from the sun and keep it cool. And they are as large as essentially a penny sport. So imagine that. Uh, the mirror itself is uh, um, three times larger than uh, the uh, mirror of the uh, Hubble Space Telescope and seven times larger than uh, the Spitzer Space Telescope, which is, uh, if you want, the predecessor of this 
telescope in terms of wavelength that uh, uh, it can observe. So here you can see the animation of how the telescope was deployed. Again, here you have the sun shield, and then uh, the mirror couldn't be sent up. Uh, it's not one piece. Uh, uh, they had to have um, um, segments and then deploy uh, these segments together with the secondary uh, mirror. Um, yeah, so there are uh, several instruments on this uh, incredible telescope. Uh, some of them are taking regular images, like the one you would take with your uh, camera. Some of them are taking spectra, so they are spreading the uh, light uh, to see uh, the composition of the material out there. And others, and this is really the uh, incredible um, achievement of this telescope, they do spectro imaging. In other words, you don't only take uh, an image, but in each pixel of your camera, you can spread the light and take a spectrum. So this is a very powerful uh, technique. Among the, the instruments that you see here, uh, there is NIRCAM in this box, because I want to uh, remind everybody that this instrument was actually built here at the University of Arizona across the street uh, at Stuart. Um, so both of these uh, facilities, ALMA as well as James Webb, they detect light at wavelengths longer than visible. So what I'm showing here is an image of the electromagnetic spectrum. Here is the visible light, and here is the Hubble Space Telescope, which we are uh, all familiar uh, with, and it's observing at those wavelengths. Um, but James Webb is observing at longer wavelengths in the infrared uh, portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, and ALMA at even longer wavelengths towards the radio. So now you may wonder, why is that? Why do we need uh, to move at these long wavelengths? Um, oh yeah, first of all, let me tell you what uh, the uh, infrared wavelengths are probing. Essentially, uh, they are uh, probing the temperature uh, of an object. And uh, I think most of you are familiar with infrared cameras. Uh, my uh, favorite use of them is to take pictures of dogs. And so <laughs> you can see here, uh, a nice picture of a dog. Here is the temperature of uh, uh, the different parts of the dog uh, in uh, centigrade. So let's see here about in the middle would be 80 Fahrenheit. And you can see there are some parts of the dog that are colder than others. So in particular, it's not. So when the Spitzer Space Telescope, which again was the predecessor of uh, James Webb, was launched, uh, I uh, also got uh, an infrared uh, picture of myself. Uh, here it is. And you can see some similarities with the picture of the dog. <laughs> okay, so why do we want to observe a bit long wavelength? So we need to uh, observe a bit long wavelength because uh, the regions where stars and planets are forming um, and a lot of small dust. You can think of them as um, particles that you have uh, uh, in the smoke. And these uh, particles um, are essentially opaque uh, to visible light. So only if you observe at longer wavelengths, you can peer through these dust environments and look at the stars as well as the environment in which planets form. So I want to illustrate that uh, by showing uh, two pictures of a portion of a star forming region from the Eagle Nebula. So this one uh, was taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. And you can see here these uh, um, often called the pillars of creation. We know that inside of these dusty regions, there are stars, because we have seen them at infrared wavelengths. So now I'm going to flip to an infrared image of this region, and you can see where these uh, parts are dark, actually there are many stars um, within, okay? So now we can do this comparison also uh, with, uh, uh, with James Webb. Uh, so this is another star forming region at more than 8,000 light years from us, and uh, uh, the Carina Nebula, and this is the portion of it. On this side, uh, you can see uh, the image taken at visible wavelengths with the Hubble Space Telescope, which is already a very powerful telescope. And on the right side, uh, you can see the corresponding image uh, taken with, with James Webb. And again, where you see dark regions here inside, you can see the stars. 
I'm not working uh, on this particular stuff for new region. I typically work on regions that are much closer to us, but I want to show you the full picture uh, that James Webb has taken of this region because it's really incredible. So this is the picture. Uh, it was on the, uh, the several press releases. And uh, again, uh, you can see here the many details, these many stars, uh, and uh, it looks like there are these valleys and um, uh, canyons here. Uh, shown uh, through these, uh, these beautiful images. Uh, I should mention that some of these pillars that you see here are actually very tall. Light takes uh, seven years to go from the bottom to the top of the pillar. So these are very large uh, um, uh, regions. Um, another example, uh, now using the Atacama Large Millimeter Array of why we need uh, uh, long wavelengths. Uh, so this is a region that is much closer to us. One that I typically study is the Taurus star forming region. You can see some of the uh, stars also uh, during night um, uh, here from Tucson. Um, and what you see here uh, in this part of the image taken with the Hubble Space Telescope um, is again a lot of nebulosity, if you want. We know by studying this region uh, that part of this material is ejected from the star and the uh, material where planets form, but we cannot really peer through the location where the star is, which is here in this uh, um, red um, rectangle. So now uh, I'm going to show you what actually Alma has seen in that part of the sky, just here. And uh, what it has seen uh, is uh, emission from pebble-sized grains, like those you can um, you have in the beach, emitting that are orbiting around the star and are emitting at this infrared, uh, millimeter wavelength. So the star here uh, doesn't show up, but this uh, should be here at the, at the center. And all these structures that you see are from these dust grains orbiting around these stars and um, assembling uh, to form planets. So how do planets form? Um, I want to show you uh, and tell you uh, the, the broad brush view of, uh, of planet formation uh, given the amount of time. So um, we can use this uh, schematic picture. So it all starts from uh, a patch of the molecular cloud, which um, we say it's gravitationally unstable. In other words, gravity wins over other forces, for instance, pressure from the gas. And when this part of the cloud becomes gravitationally unstable because um, clouds are, have an initial rotation, um, they contract because of gravity. And by contracting, they start to spin faster, okay? This is what is known as the conservation of angular momentum. And again, we are quite familiar uh, with this physical process. And we can see it, for instance, in, uh, in this animation when a skater um, moves their arms closer, then she starts to spin uh, faster. So this is the same physical process that happened here in the initial um, stage of forming the circumstellar material where planets uh, are going then to, to develop. Uh, in addition to spinning faster, the cloud, which is um, initially spherical, will also flatten in this pancake-like structure, which we call initially protoplanetary disk. Uh, then we know uh, through a series of observations that uh, the grains uh, that are initially in these clouds are very small. They are the size of the smoke, uh, but then uh, uh, initially by sticking together and later by gentle collision, they grow larger and larger up to the cores of the planets. Uh, and then if gas is left in this disk, the gas is accreted to form the atmosphere uh, of, uh, of the giant planet. Um, I just want to say that this is an incredible journey. We don't know all the details, but it's, uh, these grains are growing by 12 orders of magnitude at least. So it's really um, amazing. Um, 
Oh, yes. Uh, I should also mention that this picture uh, was drawn uh, by an artist in 2007, seven years before we took this uh, picture, the first picture of, uh, in detail of uh, a disc around the young star. So uh, this is to say it, they are not that different. So this is to say that thanks to the um, ancillary data that we had before ARM, we had already a reasonable idea of how these um, protoplanetary disks actually look like. Um, another thing that is shown here in this uh, picture uh, are um, these images of the building blocks of, of the planets. And you can think of them as uh, the building blocks of them, uh, for, for a house. And it is shown here that uh, they are of different uh, composition. In particular, uh, if uh, the material is close to the star, um, we expect them to uh, be kind of dry rocks, like those we are familiar with um, here in Puso. But if they are far away from the star, uh, the material is mixed of rock and, and ice. <laughs> and there is a very important concept in plant formation that is called uh, uh, the concept of the uh, snow line. So again, imagine here you have uh, uh, your circumstellar material orbiting the star. Close to the star is hot, and so you are water vapor. Uh, your water will be in form of vapor. And then uh, further out from the star, instead where it is cold, water vapor, which is one of the major components um, for, of uh, the gaseous yeast, will condense on twice. So again, inside there are rocks, outside a mixture of uh, uh, ice and box. Uh, again, this is a concept that we should be familiar with. Uh, and I want to illustrate it through a, a very nice picture of the Catalina mountain taken in one of those rare days uh, in which it has snowed in, in Tucson. Uh, so you can think of the snow line uh, to be located here. Above a certain elevation, it is cold enough that you have a mixture of ice and rocks uh, bare uh, rocks and uh, uh, below instead uh, um, ice uh, is not there anymore and you have instead uh, water vapor. Um, so again, this is an important concept. Uh, and in fact, uh, if we look at the solar system at the uh, distribution of the planets in the solar system, you see that these uh, rocky planets are relatively small with comparison to the outer um, planets. And this is because uh, we think that the snow line during planet formation was actually in between uh, the orbit of Mars and Jupiter. So what has happened, we think, is that um, beyond the snow line, so further away from uh, this location, there was more material because in addition to the bare rocks, you had also water ice uh, on top of them. And so you could build faster, larger planets. And inside, instead, that does not. Not happen. So to first order, the snow line explains the um, uh, one of the important properties of the planet in our solar system. So what have we learned uh, uh, with Alma? So one of the first things that we have done with this uh, incredible facility is to take a um, snapshot, snapshot short survey of uh, um, entire star forming regions. So this was not possible before because of sensitivity. We were observing one object at the time, but now with Alma, it was possible to observe in only three hours of telescope time, hundreds of stars and their disks. So you can see here uh, one example of uh, disks observed at millimeter wavelengths with, with Alma. Uh, other regions have been observed with ages between 10, 1 and 10 um, million years. And uh, um, what you can see here uh, is, again, emission from this millimeter grain and the diversity of uh, um, structures. Uh, some disks are small, some are much larger, and some shows uh, cavities in, uh, um, at these wavelengths. Uh, we got uh, two major constraints, one in terms of the amount of solids that are available to form planets uh, as a function of time, because we observe regions at different ages. And also, um, uh, we got uh, information about the uh, disk sizes and their distribution. 
So what have we learned? Um, first of all, we have learned that the mass in solids in this yeast declines with time. And this is somewhat expected because over this time range, we essentially see that planets are assembling from, from the initial uh, uh, grains. And then uh, uh, the other interesting result, which I want to illustrate here with this plot, is uh, a comparison of sizes with respect uh, to the outer edge of the solar system, which we can sharp outer edge, which we can consider to be uh, the Kuiper belt. So in this plot, uh, um, which comes from a paper uh, from a former graduate student, Nathan Handler, uh, you see the distribution of disk sizes for young regions as a function of stellar mass. <laughs> and here is the solar system, so the outer edge uh, of the solar system, the Kuiper belt. Uh, the interesting result uh, from this work, uh, and we, which we didn't know <laughs> really before, is that the um, outer edge of the solar system is not an outlier. So we do not need uh, a special physical process to, con um, to cut out the outer part of the solar system. So it's not a small uh, system for overall is within this range. Uh, there are many other open questions that uh, we want to address. I told you that we have learned about the evolution of the dust composition, um, but uh, we still don't know how the gas content of these disks evolve and how uh, the disks are going to uh, disperse, which is the physical process that le lead to uh, the dispersal of the gas. So in that regard, uh, um, I'm actually working on uh, one uh, large program with ALMA. So I told you before, um, in the first round of ALMA observations, we did surveys that were just three hours just to get a quick view of these subcoming regions. Now, this program is over 100 hours of telescope time to look in detail at the evolution of the gas in, uh, in this. And then I also have two uh, accepted programs uh, with JWST that instead will look at the uh, dispersal of the gas, in particular, the physical process leading to, uh, to this dispersal. Other questions uh, that we are going to address soon is what is the spatial distribution of ISIS in this disk? I've told you of the snow line um, in connection to the solar system and its possible, most likely, location between Mars and Jupiter. But now with uh, James Webb, uh, we have the possibility uh, to look at many more disks and see if, the, um, if that location is, uh, is typical in terms of radial distance. Also, we'll be able to um, map the molecules that are present during planet assembly, and so have an idea of the initial atmospheres of, uh, of these planets. And then finally, uh, we'll also be able to address uh, uh, this question, do planets form fast or slow? And uh, I have highlighted it here because um, in the remaining of the talk, I want to focus on that question. So let's start with a uh, giant planet. So this is a beautiful picture of, uh, of Jupiter. And we know that the atmosphere of Jupiter is mostly made of molecular hydrogen and helium in roughly solar proportion. So uh, this tells us that Jupiter accreted its atmosphere from the gaseous disk around the young star, Sun, and Jupiter formed before this gaseous disk dispersed. Uh, so in the past, uh, we have used the Spitzer Space Telescope to look at the tiny smoke sized particles around the stars in the disks, and we have seen that their frequency is decreasing with time, uh, the frequency of this uh, material. Uh, in fact, we can quantify how fast uh, it is, and we know that more 90 than 90% of the stars have lost this tiny dust uh, by 10 million years. We know uh, through physical processes that the tiny dust is coupled with the gas, so we do expect that the same dispersal time scale for the gaseous component. And so we expect the giant planets will form within 10 million years around most uh, of the stars. Now, a question to all of you, how old is our sun? I, I know there's <laughs> about 4.5 billion years. And so <laughs> it's actually quite old. 
And if you compare with uh, uh, the time it takes to form uh, the giant planets, you can see that the process of giant planet formation is relatively fast with respect to the lifetime of our sun and more generally of our stars, uh, of other stars like our sun. So uh, we know, in fact, uh, already of some giant planets that have been discovered around the nearby stars. This is an example, uh, a star which is 15, 20 million years old, has no protoplanetary disk anymore. And through ground-based observations, um, scientists have been able to discover a planet, a giant planet around it, actually a planet that is more than 10 times larger uh, than Jupiter. And very recently, uh, that planet could be actually imaged with this uh, James Webb Space Telescope. So here you can see uh, the location of the star. But remember, to get these pictures, you have to suppress the light from the star, which is much stronger than the one of the planet. And so that has been suppressed through a number of uh, uh, techniques. And here you can see the image of the planet at different wavelengths, uh, always infrared wavelengths, because this is uh, James Webb. So this is um, very interesting and already showing the capability of James Webb in detecting uh, relatively young uh, giant planets. A handful of giant planets have been already imaged inside uh, the disk that have large cavities. And I want to show you an example of that. So this is the star PDS 70. What you see here in uh, yellow orange is the emission from the disk. You can see here that there are these dark regions. It's because there is no dust inside this region. But there is a very bright spot, and that is a giant planet that has been detected again from the ground with the VLT uh, sphere. The same planet has been also detected with one of the facilities uh, that we have here at the University of Arizona, the Magellan Mag AO. And uh, again, the light from the star has been suppressed, and here is uh, the giant planet. This is the composite image of uh, the VLT sphere and the Magellan. Um, AO image. Um, with ALMA, the same disk has been uh, uh, observed in millimeter wavelengths, and this is how it looks like. So now here is the emission from the dust. Here again is a central star. But what is incredible is that you can also see the emission from these pebble-sized grains around the giant planet that is forming. So this is the circumplanetary, this dot here is the circumplanetary disk feeding uh, the planet information. So this is um, many more of these pictures, I, I'm sure will, will come out, and this is very exciting. With James Webb, we'll be able to detect planets in disks that have not yet developed full cavities, but have some structure. So we think these are less evolved uh, protoplanetary disks. I don't have a picture of them yet, but I can show you uh, two objects that are uh, soon hopefully being observed. So this is a star AS209. What you see here is the ALMA image. So again, these millimeter grains assembling the planets around the star, which is at the center. And uh, uh, through these observations, we see uh, several gaps here. And theorists have predicted that there should be a giant planet in one of these gaps. And uh, uh, there is, in fact, an approved NIRCAM uh, JWST proposal to um, look in detail into this region and hopefully detect uh, uh, the giant planet uh, in this gap. Another object that is going to be observed is around this other star. Here, um, we have used a different technique uh, to identify where the potential giant planet is. Mm -hmm. We expect it to be there. And again, there is a, a now a mini JWST proposal to look in that region and hopefully detect uh, the giant planet. Now, um, we have seen essentially that giant planets form relatively fast, but what about rocky planets? Do they form as fast as giant planet or do they form slower? And how did Earth form? Did it form uh, slow or, uh, or fast? Um, a catch here is that we cannot use the same techniques that I've shown you before uh, to detect uh, 
small rocky planets in formation because they are just too faint, uh, even with these incredible facilities that we have. So we have to use uh, different ideas on how we could uh, um, test these two possible scenarios for the formation of the rocky planet. So in the upper one is the classic uh, accretion scenario for the formation of Earth and other rocky planets. The idea is that uh, you start from uh, your small grains, you build up asteroid-like bodies, and then they start to collide with one another for a rather long period, 10 times longer than the time it takes to form Jupiter. So most of this assembly is actually happening after the gaseous disk has dispersed. Again, this is the classic scenario. However, more recently, um, thanks to these ALMA observations showing this amount of large grains in the outer part of the disk, theorists have started to think about a very different idea, which is called pebble accretion. So according to this idea, uh, you would have a large influx of pebble-sized grains from the outer disk to the inner disk. Therefore, you would increase the amount of material that you have to form the rocky planets, and you would form them fast in millions of years, together with the formation of your Jupiter. What is interesting in these models is that they predict that you need to move a lot of mass from the outer disk, where we said you have a mixture of ice and rocks, to the inner disk, about 100 times the mass of Earth. This is quite a lot. So um, one idea, we, uh, one question we were asking ourselves a few years ago was, can we test these uh, new pebble accretion scenario by studying protoplanetary disks? So, I want to ask you, since I give you these uh, mini lectures about uh, uh, the pebbles in the outer part of the disk, what happens if we are going to move pebbles, icy pebbles, from the outer part to the inner part of the disk? And they would pass the snow line. Any clue? All right, so the same thing would happen as you would take a, a rock from the upper part, um, rock and ice from the top of the uh, Catalina mountain, and then you would uh, bring it down. Essentially, the ice would melt, and you would see um, uh, the um, water vapor in the inner part of the disk once these grains are passing the uh, water snow line. Okay, so you would see an enrichment of water vapor in the inner part of the disk if really there is a lot of material from the outer part passing the snow line. So together with my former postdoc now, uh, professor at the University of Texas, Nera Manzatti, uh, we realized that actually we could use the combination of these two incredible facilities to test this scenario. Because with the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, again, you can probe the icy pebbles in the outer part of the disk, and you can measure how many pebbles are out there and what is their outermost location. And with the James Webb Space Telescope, instead, you can probe the atmosphere of the inner part of the disk, and you can see water vapor uh, if you do spectroscopy of these disks. Actually, these spectra here were taken with the uh, Spitzer Space Telescope, which was launched, uh, the much smaller telescope, which was, which was launched uh, um, well before um, uh, James, James Webb. And so we tested uh, this idea with those available data. And what we found is that there is a hint for this drifting of pebbles, significant drifting of pebbles from the outer to the inner disk. Because, as it is illustrated here, if you have a small disk that is observed with ALMA, so a small uh, um, distribution of your icy pebbles, then you have very strong water vapor uh, emission lines from the disk. And in contrast, if you have a large disk, so if your icy pebbles remain outside, you have very little um, or not strong uh, water lines from the inner part of the disk. And so uh, this is a hint for uh, this process. We cannot really quantify 
uh, with uh, uh, the Spitzer spectra, the amount of water vapor that has moved from the outer, uh, the amount of water that has moved from the outer to the inner disk. But it can be done uh, with JWST. And the reason is that the instrument that we have now on JWST, uh, MIRI, is 100 times more sensitive than the instrument that was on Spitzer. In addition, it covers down to um, five micron, and therefore it covers more water emission lines than what was possible with Spitzer. And finally, this is something that we have tested with an undergraduate student here at the University of Arizona. Uh, we have shown that if you have the spectral resolution of MIRI with James Webb, which is here in blue, you can see many more of these water lines. And so you can better constrain than what you would have, what you had with Spitzer, what is the amount, so the column density, as well as the temperature and the emitting region for, for water. Luckily, uh, there have been many uh, such disks that have been uh, uh, proposed and are going to be observed pretty soon with James Webb. In fact, we have over uh, 30 of them. And so I really think that um, it will be possible to uh, decide whether rocky planets they typically form fast or slow. So we will be able to answer uh, that question. Now, uh, I want to conclude by showing you uh, some of the uh, highlights uh, from Alma uh, and James Webb. So here we start from uh, this picture to remind everybody that for the first time using Alma, it has been possible to learn about the demographics of this disk, not looking just uh, at one disk at the time, but hundreds of disks in the same star community, and then as a function of age when you look at different uh, regions. And then uh, uh, spending much more time on individual objects with ALMA, it has been possible to uh, really look at the distribution of uh, uh, these uh, pebble-sized grains and see some indications already of how planets are assembling. More recently, uh, it has been possible not only to uh, detect the circumstellar material, but even the circumplanetary material in these um, giant planet that is forming around these young stars. With James Webb, uh, we have seen already some spectacular images of star forming regions and the possibility, the improvement in sensitivity and the possibility to detect these faint stars in, in dusty environment. And then as I've shown you, uh, the spectral resolution of, of James Webb is so much better that we'll be able actually to detect many more of these water lines and really answer uh, the question of how rocky planets form. So I think it's really uh, an exciting time uh, for me and those who are uh, working on planet formation because we can combine uh, the knowledge of the extrasolar planets that we have from the Kepler and the test survey with the environment where planets form and really answer the question of <laughs> how do planets form and which physical processes are important in that formation. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Laura, yeah, for that great uh, overview of learning about the birth of planets. Uh, you know, we talked a lot about different ages and looking at uh, stars at different ages. Can you maybe say a little bit about how do we know how old a, we have a young star or an old star? Yes. Okay. So uh, the way we do it uh, is uh, by looking at, uh, um, so first of all, it's difficult to the age of one individual star. We look at uh, many stars uh, together. And what we do is that we use the luminosity and the temperature of the star. And we place them uh, in a diagram with uh, uh, theoretical models that will tell us essentially how young or how old uh, is a star. Uh, a star like our sun is uh, in what we call uh, the main sequence. And so it's a time in which uh, the star is burning hydrogen at the center, but these young stars, they look more luminous than what they are on the main sequence. And then they cool down to arrive uh, at the main sequence. That's, that's how we do it. Yeah, thank you. Do we have any questions from the, uh, from the audience in the back there? So I'm sure you've heard this, but 
the uh, Muri's spectro mode is now shut down. Yeah. So I imagine that's a serious blow to your research plan. Well, there is here a student who was uh, who got some data, but then unfortunately, yeah, the program the program um, was stopped, and so now we are waiting to see <laughs> uh, when observation can be uh, resumed. Officially, the hold is only till October 15th. We're hopeful. Okay. <laughs> we hopeful. Meanwhile, we got data from the other program uh, using near spec. So that was good. Yeah, we weren't very happy about that. But, uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, what does the uh, mass of the star, how does the mass of the star affect the characteristics of the protoplanetary disk? Uh, this is a very nice question that I, I actually love and I work on that aspect as well. Um, so we, uh, we have seen uh, that um, essentially smaller, smaller stars, uh, which we call M dwarfs, they tend to uh, typically have more small planets close in than sun-like stars. Yeah, we have seen that with the uh, Kepler where we do um, um, occurrence rates calculation, essentially the frequency of planets around uh, these stars. And so we notice that there appears to be some scaling relation, right? So the stars is smaller, the planets are also smaller, they are closer in. And the other thing we have seen is that uh, Jupiter-sized planets, uh, they tend to be rare around uh, small stars. That goes also in the direction that perhaps there is less material, to form um, these large planets. Thank you for the question. Any other questions here in the room? Okay, let's uh, let's try online. I think uh, Amy Brenton. Uh... Uh, right now, there aren't any online questions. Okay. Uh, if it, uh, any more any more uh, questions from the room? Yeah. So. Um, if there's more material caught in the outer disk, more of like the icy uh, pebbles, mm -hmm. does that mean that there will be more maybe gaseous planets than maybe like graphene planets, or is that kind of differ for um, protoplanetary disk? No, that's actually the inference that you would preferentially form your large gaseous icy planets in the outer part of the disk. However, we have also seen uh, through Kepler or test observations, it's also from ground based observation, that there are some large planets, gaseous giant planets, very close to the star. Some of them are so close that they are called the hot Jupiters. Probably you have heard about this class of planets. So we don't think that actually those planets they form there where they are seen now, but we think that they formed outside and then some way they migrated uh, inward, either when there was a gaseous disk or later other processes. Uh, so this inward drift model is related to some sort of decaying orbit. So you have a series of particles that are approaching like the center of gravity. Um, what exactly stops the unstable orbit to coalesce into rocky planets that have stable orbits? OK, so first of all, I, I did not discuss the uh, process of how we think that, uh, let's take a picture here from this one, uh, the Alma. Um, I want to show you the figure. Oops. Yeah, okay. So um, I have not discussed actually how these uh, grains, they move inward, how they drift inward, but that is due to, um, the, um, the kind of a friction between the gas and the particle that slows them down, and then uh, they they move, uh, they lose angular momentum and they move inward. Okay? okay, so that's the reason, not because of other particles. It's the uh, particle to gas um, uh, physics that leads to this migration. But then uh, what happens is that um, in some places there are kind of traffic jams. And so you form this type of rings, right? And we think that in these rings, uh, if you assemble enough of these small particles, then the ring can become gravitationally unstable and you can form 
a bigger core. So that's how that's how it works. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, as far as globular clusters and open clusters go, have you detected any uh, exoplanets on the outskirts of globular clusters or in uh, open clusters at all? Um, I think there were attempts, but I'm not sure that there were detections actually. There was a big survey to try to look at early on, early on in exoplanets, to look at some globular clusters to look for planets, and they didn't see any. So there was some speculation that maybe the processes that give you uh, in those environments don't favor planet formation. And I don't know if that's been done better since then or not, but that's a good question. I don't think, uh, you know, as far as open clusters go, I mean, those are pretty young stars, so maybe they don't have any planets so, around yet. Yeah, so actually one of my students is looking at uh, younger uh, clusters that are, 10, 15 million years old, it is a bit more difficult to detect planets around that, those because the stars are variable. And so when you use this technique of, uh, or any other technique, both the radial velocity or the transit, um, it's going to be more challenging to, to see the dimming uh, due to, to the planet. But there are some detections already. With the test survey, which is a North Sky survey, uh, we have thousands and thousands of uh, young stars to monitor and look for uh, for planets. Um, what we have seen is that we can detect uh, relatively easily giant planets, but as we said, they are not as common as a, sm a smaller planet. Uh, but we don't have the sensitivity because of this variability to detect uh, Earth-sized planets. So. We'll be looking at something larger about Earth. And our next, uh, the lecture next month uh, by Ty Robinson is going to be talking about future, the kind of future space telescopes we would need to really get down to rocky planets. Um, anybody else here? In the ALMA image of the PDS 70 system, uh, what's the reason we only see the PDS 70 C without seeing the PDS 70 B? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. Okay, so let's go back. Okay, so um, I mean, um, two planets <laughs> have been uh, uh, detected around this star. Uh, I don't think I have the pictures of both of them here uh, because I didn't show the, the nature paper that detected both. Uh, but <laughs> interestingly, only one of them seems to have enough material, uh, enough dust to be uh, detected with ALMA. The other one, for some reason, either it has already dispersed that uh, dusty disk or it's much less massive and we cannot see it at the sensitivity. Uh, these were very deep observations, so I don't think we can go much better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll do one more check online with uh, Amy. Any online questions? No online questions right now. Okay. All right. Well, if there's uh, no more questions here, let's uh, thank our speaker again.